Hey, welcome to Mission Bible Church. We're so glad you decided to join us this weekend. Here is just a little bit about us. We are a community of Christ followers who are committed to being real with God, real with each other, and real in the world. This weekend, we will continue our final 40 series. Let's get started here in just a few moments. We are so glad that you all have decided to come out and join us here today. Whether you're here in person or online, we are glad you are here. Um, how many of you guys were in church last week, last weekend? Was it not amazing? Um, ah, it was so great. I want to give a huge shout out to all of the people that were working in the parking lot and the greeters and the people, especially, especially the people making the coffee and making us all feel so welcome and at home, right? I also want to give a huge shout out to the tech team, those people that made this stuff look so amazing. Of course, we know it's not about looks. It's all about serving God and, um, and coming to know him on a more personal level. And can I say, hello, baptisms. 18 people got baptized last weekend over four services, and it was amazing. And what is so exciting about today is we are going to be able to hear their stories. Everybody's got a story. I got a story. All y'all got stories, and we're going to be able to hear them today. So I'm so excited about that. So, but before you guys get too comfortable, I want to invite all of you to stand up, meet someone new. If you don't see someone new, see someone you haven't seen in a while and tell them a story. Tell them your story.
is our mighty fortress. He is our everlasting Father. God is our firm foundation. Let's continue to worship his name. Christ is my firm foundation.
legacy Far beyond what eyes could ever see Yet he stands in front of me How good is he? He paints a canvas with a million stars Yet still he holds my heart Our Father in heaven, the light of salvation. Oh, how good is He? The breath of Almighty before and behind me. Oh, how good is He? How good Bound by circumstance He's the God of second chance How good is He? When a sinner's heart is all that I can bring Still He welcomes me How good is He? Father, you go before us and behind us. You are in our comings and our goings. God, we praise you. You are a good, good Father. Father, we worship you because you are worthy and holy and worthy of our praise. And 
Nation, it's great to see you. Trisha here, and I have everything you need to know for this upcoming week. We are so excited to announce that Mission will be sending a team on a short-term missions trip to Guatemala this summer. July 3rd through the 13th, we will be partnering with local churches and ministries to serve the people of Guatemala. Our main areas of ministry will include construction projects, medical clinics, and some school outreach assemblies. This trip is an easy on-ramp for discovering more about worldwide missions and what it means to be part of the global church. For more information, you can check out the Church Center app for registration or talk to Pastor Brent. Our Endeavor team is once again partnering with Versity Blood Centers to host a blood drive right here in the parking lot of Minooka's campus. From 8 a.m. until noon on April 28th, there will be 20 different time slots for you to fill. If you're interested in donating, please scan the QR code on the screen or check out the registration that comes out in our weekly email. Mission Women is hold, hosting their second annual Mother's Day tea on Saturday, May 4th. Join us for an afternoon of fun and fellowship as we spend time honoring the most influential women in your life. There will be tea, light snacks, activities, a photo booth, and an encouraging devotional. Bring your mother, grandmother, mother-in-law, spiritual mom, and daughters of all ages. It's going to be such a sweet time together. For more information and to register, head over to the Church Center app. Finally, if you haven't heard, Mission Spy Kids registration is opening this Wednesday, April 10th at 6 p.m. Spy Kids is our summer day camp for first through fifth graders, and we are so excited to be celebrating our 25th year. Every summer at Mission, all of our energy and creativity is poured into this week where kids can encounter the amazing life-changing truth of Jesus and the scriptures in one action-packed week. So if you want your students to participate in the fun that Spy Kids has to offer, make sure to mark your calendars and check out missionspykids.com for more information. That wraps up our updates this week, Mission. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing you here next weekend. All right, pretty exciting stuff, yeah? I am so stoked for that mother's tea. It is going to be epic. But Spy Kids is going to be cool too. So here's the thing. Spy Kids, and this is what one, actually one thing I want to say is if, um, if you could, if you could scooch just a little bit. We have a couple people that just need seats. So just if you could just scooch in, that'll be awesome. Um, but while you're scooching, let the scooch continue. But while you're scooching, one of the things that's so cool about Spy Kids is this, is that, or it's, it's just kind of amazing. There are... 600 spots, Six, we want to afford 600 kids the ability to be at Spy Kids, make room for 600 kids, it's going to be super, super cool. However, registration is opening when? 6, 6 p.m. on what day? Which Wednesday? This Wednesday, okay. So here's the thing. A lot of times, if it was me, I'd be like, 600 spots, I got time. This event's not until June. Last year, the 600 spots sold out within 24 hours. So... If you are a parent of a kid that's going into first through fifth grade, or you are a grandparent or an aunt or uncle of a kid going through first or fifth grade, or your kids have got friends or, that would want to be at this event, or if you've got a neighbor kid, whether you like the neighbor kid or not, and they're going through, in through first or fifth grade in the fall, make sure Wednesday at 6 p.m., not, not Thursday, not Friday, not a week from Wednesday, Wednesday, this Wednesday at 6 p.m., that they register to make sure that we got a spot for them. We don't want to have anyone miss out on that, all right? Okay, we're going to um, take our offering right now, and what we do in offering is we don't pass a bag. It's all something people can actually give in the back. Most people give online or through text, um, and one of the things that I just, I got to brag on this church, we talk all the time about how when we give at this church, we're not just doing a, a box check. Like, it's not just like, okay, I, I, uh, I, you know, I go to this church, therefore I'm going to check the box of, you know, giving, or I grew up in church, and I guess giving is part of the thing. You sing songs, you learn stuff, and you give, and that's just part of the game. You know, if, if that's been routine for you, I, want, I hope that you're experiencing something different here. At this church, we really do believe that giving is a part of us being aligned with God's mission, and that it's not just us giving to, you know, things to help ministries and programs happen on this campus, but we see things happening in missionaries across the oceans. And another awesome, awesome aspect of all that is what we've been talking about for the past couple of months, that when we give, something starts in us as a launching pad on Sunday morning when we're giving that we see carrying on throughout the rest of the week. And the thing that's been so trippy for me is watching even this past week as people in this church, when we put out an opportunity to step into helping someone else, this church is 
so generous. You guys are just naturally, or, or you're, you've just become, or you're becoming more and more like Jesus. Therefore, you're just like, you're, you step to the plate and you step in and generously help out each and every time. If you're here as a visitor, you're sitting next to some of the most generous people in all of Grundy County, like maybe even Grundy and Will County. Probably not Kendall, but like, the, but Grundy and Will for sure. And that's, that's awesome. And so what we want to do is we want to ask that God not only uses what we're giving to impact, but that God uses us giving to impact us and change us into the person that he's making us into. So let's pray for that right now. Lord God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to step into your mission. We thank you for putting us on mission. And we're asking as a church, as Mission Bible Church, that you not only prompt us to step in and be generous, God, but that that leads to shaping and coaching and conditioning our hearts to be the type of people that are going through Monday through Friday as people with our eyes wide open to opportunities where we can step in, that we can see needs and meet them. And we can do that not to be a, a nicer person or a better citizen, but because that makes you happy and it makes us a little bit more and more like you. And we love that. So God, I thank you so much for this generous church. I thank you for the impact they're making. And I pray that you just continue to make the impact within them. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay, amen. So we had this awesome, awesome, awesome thing happen last week. It was called? Yeah, we, that was very unimpressive. But yes, it was. It was Easter. Uh, but how many were here for Easter last week? Okay, yeah, a lot of us. It was awesome. And one of the cool things was 18 people got baptized. And what we wanted to do was, to, we, before they get baptized, we just asked them, you know, tell us, what, you know, why are you getting baptized? What's, your, what's part of your story? And so 18 people took that step last week, and we wanted to get a chance to hear a little bit of their story. Now, we're also going to have, like, clips of them getting baptized. And we're dorks at this church. We go weird for that type of stuff. We celebrate that because we, we see a picture in that of what God's done in our heart. And so I want to encourage you to, like, cheer and bap—not eh, not baptize— that would be impressive if you could do that in here. Cheer and celebrate each one of those. But there's 18 of them, so buckle up. I mean, it's going to be a lot of this, but that's all at the end. So, but let's celebrate what God has done. Let's take a look at these folks' the story. Yeah, so I attended uh, Mission Bible my whole life, and I came to know God from a very young age, and I always knew who God was. Um, well, I've kind of been surrounded by this church ever since I was little. I have came here with my family for a long time. Um, my parents always took me to church when I was a kid, but um, I just started, like, I didn't really, like, know much, and I didn't really understand it as much. I've been in this church since I was two years old, or so I've been told. Um, but I've just, like, always had Jesus in my life. Well, I was never baptized, um, my my dad was baptized Catholic, but my parents just, I, for whatever reason, decided not to baptize me. Jesus has always been part of my life, uh, a lot of ministers in my family. I let him get away with, throughout the years. Um, in my house has always been a Christian household for the most part. And at first it wasn't super pushed, but I started to realize that there's some things that you're just not gonna make it through without God. And so for years, I felt like, like a piece was missing from my life. Then in November, uh, just had a life-changing experience. So going through a tough time in my life, I did a lot of bad things throughout my years. And He sort of spoke to me in my lowest point. Yeah, I kind of came to the realization and that I needed to make God first in my life, not just like part of my life. I just felt like the world was a really crazy place. And then 2020 like solidified for me that it's a spiritual battle. A few years ago, my sisters got baptized and I felt like I wanted to to also. So I started to read the Bible and it helped me understand more. I feel like when I really started like like focusing and like really wanting to learn was from my friend Noah. Uh, he was like really was the one who just showed me like to pay attention and that you should be learning. 
And so I started doing more reading, you know, Bible reading, um, watching different sermons online. Uh, I went on the Evergreen Retreat this year, and I kind of felt like I heard this voice almost, and it really moved me into getting baptized. One day, yeah, I was just at church, and I saw God there. And normally, I don't really like get church, but there just kind of felt like he was talking well. I talked to Pastor Brandon. We decided this is a good start, you know, fresh start. When I went to Southfield Church, I had gone to a couple um, church camps in the summer, and I got a lot closer to him then. So I've been attending this week, and I felt like God moving. So I wanted to go to the uh, winter retreat, and I felt like God moving so hard in my life. And then Kashima, who's a parishioner here, she lives on my block, and we became friends. And so she invited me to church. And so I've been coming every Sunday since the first Sunday of January. And I just really felt Jesus coming back and I like realized this is really important. Like I need to surrender my life to Jesus. And so I'm wanting to get baptized for a while now. And I felt like this was the right time. I feel like I've been ready to take the next step and kind of learn more. And I've been yearning to do this for a while actually. And I feel like today's I feel like it's just been, like, I've been thinking about getting baptized for a while, so I just feel like it's time. So in spite, his I asked God in, into my heart, and it was, I was excited for it. I wasn't um, baptized in my old church, and I'd just like to show everyone here that I believe in Jesus. Oh, um, I'd like to publicly accept him into my life and fully commit to Jesus. You know, because, like, once you get baptized, they say that you're now, like, you gave yourself to God, and... I really want to do that, and I really want to do it for myself. And I know that I am a child of God, and Jesus will. I'm getting baptized today to show that I'm a new creation in Christ. Jesus. He loves me, he died for me, and he just, it, it's just what I feel like is right. It's to show that I'm living for Jesus, and like, it's really important, and I really want to get baptized for Jesus. And I want, I want everybody to know publicly that I believe in him. Hey, I, I do believe just to get my faith out there and not only just to prove something to God, but to prove it to myself that I do believe. Well, I've always wanted to be baptized ever since I was uh, um, very little. And I just feel like this is going to pronounce my devotion and, and trust into it, Jesus. I want to proclaim it. I know it's not ne like a necessary for salvation, but I feel like I, ha I have to proclaim it out loud. fresh start, a whole new me. The man, I want him to be a big part of it, and I want to show you that he's part of it. Oh, man. I want to go back. It was the, and here's the names of the 18 people. And I put those up there because these are people we need to pray for, we need to walk alongside. When you get baptized, it's not like, sweet, you cross the finish line. Boom. No, 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 no. 
Baptism is following Jesus' command. And these people are going to follow Jesus from this point on. And we need to be there alongside them. When they fall, we're there. When they're victorious, we cheer. We celebrate that. And the, the sermon series that we're in right now is actually Jesus doing that for his disciples right be- between when he rose from the grave and when he went back to heaven. This p- series that we're in right now is called the 40, it's, a, it's the final 40. And the final 40 is all about what Jesus did in, that, in those 40 days to prepare his disciples to follow him strong, hard, and to the end of their life. And that's so important for us to pick up on. So if you've got your Bibles, open them to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 20. This is like, if if that's familiar, it's because we started last week on Easter in John chapter 20. And we're going to continue on. I'm going to be reading out of my NIV. If you still have the New Living Translation booklets, those work. If you got an ESV or a King James Version or some other translation, those will work too. But I'm going to be reading out of NIV. And then we'll have New Living Translation on the screen in just a little bit. All right, let's stand for the reading of God's word. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jump down to 24. Now Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All right. I um, hope you had, if, if you're if someone who's had the opportunity to have um, something vacation-y on spring break, I hope it was awesome. My family, we typically do lame spring break things because we're usually really busy getting up, gearing up to Easter. Um, and at best, we're going to do a, a, an awesome staycation type event. But this time, the week before Easter, was just like so jammed. There's just no way we could do that. And so, but Monday, the, the kids had off on Monday. And so we're like, we got to do something where we like maximize this final day of vacation. And so we decided to head on up to Chicago, and it was super fun. Um, actually, if I could have the DLP working in the back as well. There, we have, uh, this, is, this was like an amazing moment where we have, uh, we got, basically for us, if you're a McFadden, we try to do anything we can for as cheap as possible. Like, if it cost $2, we're like, hmm. So, like, but we're, like, trying to figure out how to pull this off. So we go to Harold Washington Library, which is amazing. It's, like, 10 stories of library. And then on the, on the top, they've got this, like, really cool garden area up there. And then we, we, we this was, this was our, our awesome thing. We went down all the escalators, all of them. Sometimes we were standing. Sometimes we were, like, on, like, all fours on the... It was so cool. And so we were walking through the city, having a great time. We got a chance to um, get lunch um, with Grace. Um, on the left-hand side here, that's Carson. And we got to meet up with Carson's girlfriend, Grace, at Mr. Beef. And then we had, got coffee with Michael's, Micah's girlfriend, uh, Carlisle, right there, which is basically like a tour of the girlfriends. And, um, but the whole thing was, was leading to um, our dessert. Our der- dessert was at some place I had never gone to called Margie's Candies. And, and it was, I never heard of it. It's up in Bucktown. But it was like, oh yeah, this secret Chicago, you should go to this place. This place has been a secret for like since 1930. That's when they opened. But they have awesome ice cream. And so we're, we go up there, we're driving around trying to find a parking spot. Can't find a parking spot. And I'm like about to spot hero a parking spot or something. But I'm like, wait a minute, right across the street, there's a parking spot. There's like a McDonald's, and it's got a McDonald's parking lot. Boom! And so we go over there, we park, and then I see the sign. The sign says, okay, if you're going to park, basically, this is Errol's paraphrase, if you're going to park here, you got to buy something from McDonald's. So I did. I bought a coffee. And I'm like, all right, kids, let's go. And then we walked across the street to Margie's, Margie's Candies. And we went there, and we had ice cream, and it was super cool. We had an awesome, it was delicious. It started to rain outside. I'm like, what an awesome day we had. We're going to like, go across the street, get in the car, drive home in the rain, and just go, what an epic final day of spring break as a family in Chicago. This rules. 
And as we're walking through the rain to the car, Julie comes alongside the passenger side and says, Errol, there's a boot on our car. I know. (laughs) That's exactly what I thought, more or less. And all of a sudden, I look across the parking lot, and there's a dude, a security dude, in his white little security car that apparently he was there the whole time watching me, waiting for me to come back. And he gets out of his car like, I'm like, Meow. and I walk on over there. I'm like, dude, I got a boot on my car. He's like, yeah. It's like, you, you're in violation of the parking lot. I'm like, no, 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 no. It says I got to buy something. I did. Now, I didn't tell him I just bought like a buck coffee. But I did. I, bought a, I, I, I paid for what it took to be in this, in this parking lot. And he's like, no, 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 did you read the rest of the sign? I'm like, did I read, like, the fine print? <laughs> and so I kept on reading, and down the sign, it says this, more or less, you have to buy something from McDonald's to park here. But if you leave this parking lot, you are in immediate violation and will be fined. In other words, if you're just using this parking lot to go across the street to Margie's Candies, We're going to boot your car. And I said, how do I take care of this? And then he gave me this. It was awesome. (laughs) And he said, all it takes is $170. And I I literally went, what? Like, I I was not even, like, dialing it back. My my Christianity, my uh, mature adulthood, it's gone. I'm like, are you serious? I bought a coffee. I was just across the street getting dessert with my poor, poor family who are standing outside the car that you booted. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I need to dial it back. And I eventually paid the thing. But it's like, like, oh my gosh, I thought, I totally thought that what I bought from McDonald's was going to withstand me leaving the parking lot. And yet it didn't. And that's exactly what happens with a lot of us, with our faith. If you've raised kids and you raise them in the church, you're like, you know what? I'm just so glad that what they're getting here, they're getting the happy meal of the gospel. They're growing up with a, an understanding of the Bible and Jesus, and they, maybe they graduate into Evergreen and 360, and they get like the Big Mac of the gospel. And what they get here is going to, when they leave the parking lot of this church and they go into the wild, into the real world, what they got here is going to be sufficient to survive out there. But there's a fear What if it isn't? If you don't have a kid, you're just a Christian. Maybe you're a young Christian or you're an old Christian. And you thought, man, I really believe this stuff. I'm finding myself growing in this. But what happens when my faith meets doubt that I can't compute, I can't handle? What if I run across a podcast or a YouTube or a friend that doesn't believe and their points are really compelling? What's gonna, is the faith that I got here gonna survive out there? Or will my faith not make it past the parking lot? right? Which brings us to Thomas. Thomas has got an awesome nickname. What's his nickname? I know. It's like so messed up. That's nowhere in the Bible. And yet we totally know this guy's nickname and we've like castigated him to be like known for the one thing, one part of his life. He did epic stuff before this, epic stuff after this, and yet we know him for one freeze frame of his life, doubting Thomas. And like, if you got like questions about your faith, what an idiot, doubting Thomas over here. And like, all of a sudden, like we, and I, I want to say right from the get-go, we should not have that perspective with Thomas. This is not Thomas's darkest moment. This is the brightest moment of his faith that launches into a faith that is significant, which brings us back to that list of people. Do you believe that they're never going to have any hard questions? Do you believe that they're never going to have difficult doubt? I'll answer for you. I doubt it. I doubt that they'll never have doubt. Not if they're a a person that's actually living out their faith or reading the Bible. If you're reading the Bible and you're living out your faith in the wild, in the real world, you better have hard questions and you better have some doubts. Doubts are the thing that can actually be the catalyst for growth. They can actually derail your faith or they could lead you to something so, so much more beautiful. And that's what we see in Thomas. Don't let, and this is what I want us to get home, like bat home today. Don't let doubt be your out. It's been a lot of people's outs. It's like, basically, they've, that's where they got off the highway of faith. Their doubts were, were so difficult and strong that they had to like, they bounced, they were off. Don't let doubt be your out. Instead, let it be the doorway to depth. 
If you're in any relationship, you're going to have a point of growth that comes from a skepticism or a doubt. You're going to raise hard questions. And by raising those hard questions, it actually platforms you to have a deeper faith. And we're going to be looking at three questions that we see Thomas asking in this this whole process that actually helps him have the latter reality, that letting doubt be the doorway to depth. Here's the first question, which actually has to do with questions. Within yourself, ask, what are the questions causing tensions within your faith? Ask yourself, what are things that I struggle with? That when I'm thinking about faith or Christianity or the Bible, what is it that I have a hard time believing? Because they're there. Like I could tell you some of mine. You, could, you should think about what are things that when you, when you study it, when you learn about it, you're like, what? I mean, is that for real? Like for real, for real? Ask, asking, the, like knowing what those questions are, are important. Thomas did that. Look in this passage. In John chapter 20, it says this. But he replied, Thomas replied to these guys, I won't believe. And now here's the thing. He's responding to them when they said, we've seen the Lord. And the Greek grammar is such that it says that they were saying that in the active tense, which means that it wasn't just, we've seen the Lord. It's like, over and over and over and over again. It's like this, invit- it's like, so, I don't know if you've had anyone nag you or say something over and over and over again. Like, dad, 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 dad. Are you gonna go? Are you gonna go? Are you gonna go? You're gonna go? Did you, get, did you see the score? Did you see the score? Did you see the score? Are we gonna go to the movies? Are we gonna, you know, yeah, I don't know if you've had people in your life where they've just like, it's just like ongoing. That's what Thomas is experiencing. He's been experiencing the annoyance of someone who's just like, okay, okay, you guys take it down a notch. I wasn't there. I mean, just talk about like FOMO. This is like a massive fear of missing out situation where all the other disciples experienced the risen Christ. Thomas wasn't in the room. He wasn't there. And so when they're freaking out and flipping out and going, this is amazing. He's just like, I can't jump to that belief. I've got questions. I've got doubts. And until, I won't believe it, until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Thomas had questions. Questions are not sin. It is not evil. It's not something that you should suppress or bury. When, when Julie and I were, were first started dating, like two months in, um, I was blown away that she would actually date me. Like seriously blown away. I knew her for a year up to that point. I, and then she said yes. And I was just like, really? And so, I, I mean, I was shocked. And so like, it was like one of these amazing things. But I was like, if I just, if I'm a good enough boyfriend, if I'm not stupid, if I don't screw this up, this is going to be amazing. But I kept on thinking in my head, like, she's just going to find out how normal and lame I am. And she's just going to go, mm. And so, like, I, but I, so I, I'm fearing that. I've got this insecurity. Now, on top of that, at Moody, at the school I went to, a lot of the people I knew, this is going to sound so nerdy. So just full disclosure, this is, sound, this, maybe you won't even understand or relate to this. I knew so many people that were so, like amazing singers. They had all these different singing groups on campus. All of my friends could sing. Julie is an amazing singer. All of them could sing. Everyone, except for me. And so like, I'm like, they're going on tours, like to different countries and states and singing and stuff. And I'm at home just like going, nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing there. And so like, I was like starting to get weirded out by that. Like all of um, our friends are gifted in this area. Julie's gifted in this area. And I wonder if she like grew up wishing that one day she would marry somebody who could sing, who could sing duets with her. Now, I believe in miracles, <laughs> but not that big. I'm like, she's going to, like, I'm going to be such a letdown. Because she's always, and so I'm just like, I got to say something to her. Because if I, and so I, so we're walking to a place called Mr. G's to get um, some food for a friend of hers. And I finally had the guts to say something I'm like, Julie, I just gotta, I just gotta ask you a question. I just gotta tell you something. Listen, I think that I love that we're together. I'm blown away that you're with me. This is amazing. I feel like our relationship's getting better and better. But I'm never gonna be a singer. Now that might make you laugh, but in the moment it was really hard for me to say that. <laughs> Sensitive, sensitive. Oh. I, I, and I said, "You probably one day want to sing duets with somebody, and that's never gonna be me." And so, if you wanted just to like find somebody, because there's our school is so full of like these amazing people, amazing guys. They love Jesus and they can sing. And if you wanted to like just switch rails and, and go with one of those guys, I totally, I would totally would understand. And she said, "I'm so glad you said that." 
No, she didn't say that. Um, <laughs> she looked at me and she's like, are you serious? You think, you think I'm dating you because I think you might be able to sing a duet with me? And when she, when she said it, it sounded way dumber than when, <laughs> when it was in my head. But here's the thing, as dumb as that moment was in general, and you can attest to that, that was so important for me because that was something, that was a question that was causing tension within me. And if I didn't open up about that, that was going to live in my brain. And I would, whenever there would be someone like singing in a duet, these, this couple that's singing, I, I, always just, I would probably think, what is she thinking? I needed to ask that. And that doubt, that skepticism, could you really like me even though I can't sing, led to de- depth in our relationship. It wasn't an out, it led to depth. Ask the question, what are the questions causing the tensions in your faith? Second, you need to ask this, who are the other believers that I can surface this to? Who are, and and we, let's take a look at John. John, I love this. The first part of this, it just simply says, he replied. I love this. I love that he replied to these guys. These are Jesus followers. He has his questions. He has his doubts. He also was a Jesus follower, but now he's not sure because he met with the fact that Jesus died. And so he's not really jump on the like, resurrection train just yet because he's got his questions. He's got his doubts. But I love the fact that he replied to them. And what he didn't reply to, they're like, Jesus, we we met the risen Lord. I love that he didn't say, oh, that's awesome. Cool. Even though inside he's like, I doubt it. He surfaced his doubts. Thomas replied. And here's the thing, church. You and I need to be the type of Christians that are bold in asking questions bold in small groups, and when we're hanging out with people and we're getting to know other Christians more, bold in raising objections and saying, listen, I don't know if I understand this. I don't know how I can believe this. Like, does every Christian believe this? Is this what the Bible actually says? Like, how can I get on that train? And, and to be bold in that. We are not trained to be bold in asking questions in Christianity. We are trained to shut up and bury it. But zero relationships get better if you bury hard questions. They don't get more healthy, they get more damaged. So does your faith. If you are a Christian in this church, or you're investigating Christianity at at this church, which a lot of you are, and I love that, boldly ask questions. There's no questions that are off limits. We love that. There, there's, um, when people first come to this church, I, I love new people at our church because they haven't learned yet that it's not good to ask questions. Like they haven't been Christians long enough to know that that's taboo. And so they're just like, so I got some serious questions. You got any time? I'm like, sure. One person said, I got, I got a lot of questions. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe they got three or four. We met in my office. They had t- literally 20 questions. And these weren't like PG questions. These were like heavy duty, hardcore questions. Bam, bam, bam. And it was awesome. We love that because it's through those hard questions, boldly ask them, that we can actually find out and actually lead into depth in our relationship. So if, you are, if you're a Christian here, be bold in your questions. Boldly ask those. It's been such a bummer for me over my lifetime, but, but 26 years of pastoring, to know people that I saw following Jesus with all of their heart, and then all of a sudden they're having coffee with me or they're meeting in my office or we're just hanging out and they say, you know what, Errol, here's the deal. I used to love Jesus and follow him with all my heart. But I just don't believe. I don't believe anymore. Now, them telling me that they don't believe anymore, that wasn't the thing that was the deepest ugh, gut check. That's hard to hear. But that wasn't hurtful to hear. What was hurtful to hear is like, you've been, you've been torturing yourself with this for two years. And you never said anything. You never asked any of these questions. I mean, these questions I've wrestled with, I, I, could have been, I could have been there with you, but you never surfaced it. Now, I'm not putting that on these people that I've talked to. I'm putting that on me. Why was I not safe enough to ask that? Or what have we cultivated as, as a type of vibe that it's not safe to ask those questions? If you're a Christian, or you're a growing Christian, or you're investigating Christianity, be bold. Secondly, though, if you're, if you're someone that's on the receiving end of one of those questions, be merciful. Here's the thing. I always thought that the, vi- the, the I mean, you just kind of get the perspective that the Bible must tell us that when someone is doubting, there's a really good response to that person. You make them feel bad, and you tell them they're going to hell. I mean, these questions, that question will send you right to hell. That was a to hell question you should have never thought of, let alone say out loud. 
Because now you put it into the ether of the air. Now other people are going to get infected with that question. That's the vibe we think that the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. There is a verse I didn't even know was in the Bible until I was meeting and studying this with Pastor Eric. And he said, well, there's that one verse. I'm like, and it comes from a book of the Bible that only has one chapter. So not a lot of verses. I should know this verse in a one chapter book with one verse of that chapter. And I didn't even know it was there. This is the posture and position that the church should have towards those who doubt. In Jude 1, it says, be merciful. It does not say be judgmental to those who doubt. It does not say be guilt-trippy or harsh to those who doubt. Be ticked off at those who doubt. Belittle those who doubt. It says be merciful. Why? Because doubt is part of growth. It leads to depth especially in the type of environment that nurtures that. I want this church and the other churches that we're connected to in our, in our, both in Morris and all our friends that are in other churches in this area, I want, us to, I want the church to be the safest place on planet Earth for someone to boldly ask hard questions in and not feel like they're gonna get rejected or kicked to the curb. I want this church, I want us to be, and if you're somebody that has heavy doubts that you have not surfaced, you have not asked, and you're here, Folks, way to go. You made it. You have doubts. You have questions, but you keep on showing up. So props to you. Keep going on that. That's how we grow. Ask the question, what are the questions that are leading to the tension of my faith? Ask, who is it that I can actually share this with? Who are the believers that I can share this with that are walking through some of these same realities? And thirdly, find credible answers. Where can I find credible answers from One of the things that's so important is this. We are so privileged in 2024 because we, like my questions that I have about Jesus or my questions that I have about the Bible or about faith have been asked for 2,000 years. I'm not the first one that's had these doubts and questions. People have been asking these questions for 2,000 years. How much harder would it have been to be the first followers of Jesus that didn't have 2,000 years of people thinking and asking hard questions that we could learn from. Like these disciples, this is all like right out of the gate. They're they're the people that are finding out this stuff in, in real time. Jesus would have to do something so significant for them to help jumpstart their faith so that they could actually carry that faith, and he did. What Jesus did was Jesus said to them, or what Jesus realized was that he wanted to, with all the disciples, including Thomas, he didn't leave Thomas out, He wanted to make sure that he stepped in and that they got a chance to see the resurrected Jesus. This is what the passage says. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Jesus is saying to him, I want you to see this. Caravaggio um, is an, a painter. I've, I've talked about this painting. My favorite painting is Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. But I think my second favorite painting is Caravaggio's Doubting Thomas. And it's a picture where you have this scene. And I don't know why Caravaggio painted Thomas to be like so ancient, but because he was more like a teenager. But regardless, you've got Thomas and you look at the wrinkles on his forehead. He's just like, whoo, whoo. Like this action, it, it's true. And the thing that I love about that is that he is like blown away. But the thing I think is so important is Jesus' hand in this painting. He's grabbing his hand and pulling it. I want you, Thomas, to know. I want you to have the confidence. I don't want this to be a fickle or flaky faith. I want this to be strong. Jesus, with his disciples did something so amazing. He wanted them to have the understanding that this happened because he was going to send them out to tell everyone else. He said, this isn't staying in Jerusalem. This is going to the ends of the world. And if they're going to believe this, they're going to have to have legit proof. And so what was called the office of the apostle is established, and it's in Acts 121. And in order to be an apostle, you have to have walked with Jesus where you heard his teachings so you could later on relay them. You had to know that he died. But you had to have one other thing. Because if you just have these two, you're just passing on, Jesus was a good teacher. He had some moral things to pass on. 
But in order to be in the office of the apostle, apostle means messenger, what Jesus said, I'm sending you guys out. You had to not only walk with Jesus, getting his teachings, see that he died, but also literally and physically see the resurrected Christ. Why? Because the world was gonna have hard, legitimate pushback to Christianity. And they would need solid, firsthand eyewitness accounts. No, it's not just that I know somebody who saw him risen from the grave. I was there. And so that was the movement. That's what jumped, that's what kickstarted the reality of, of Christianity spreading all throughout the world so fast, was it was led by eyewitness accounts. In this passage, we see this. Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God. He's not doubting Thomas. That hard question led to depth, and Jesus receives him there. And Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Thomas goes on, and, he, and, he, and he, his faith continues to grow. That doubt was the jumpstart to the rest of his faith. Tradition tells us that he died many years later in right around 72 AD. And the way that he died was kind of messed up. You see, he had so much faith from that event, he kept on telling people about Jesus and kept on telling people about Jesus and kept on telling people about the res resurrected Jesus. And I was there and I saw and I felt and I touched. I know that this is true. I'm not telling you what my granny taught me. I'm telling you what I saw. And he does this over and over and over again to the point that he's deep into India. And they're saying, we want you to recant. They're not calling him to recant or say, I don't, uh, they're not calling him to recant what he said he believes in. They're calling him to recant what he said he saw, and he wouldn't do it. And so they take a spear, and they press it through his stomach. And that's how Thomas dies, doubting Thomas. No way, man. This guy's a stud. Why? Because doubt was not, it wasn't an out. It was a doorway to deeper depth. I love that Caravaggio painting, especially when you zoom in on it. Because I love the fact that in the midst of Jesus and the, his other disciples, the person in the top right-hand corner is Caravaggio himself. He painted himself into the painting. Caravaggio wrestled with his doubt. He struggled to have faith. And so when he's commissioned to paint Thomas in this scene, he paints himself in as one who's also looking in. Is it real? Can I believe is this evidence stronger than my doubts and my skepticism? And I just love his mouth, just agape, just like just blown away by the fact that it is. All right, in closing, um, here's a couple of things. If you've got your phone, I want to encourage you to take them out. There are credible sources out there. Um, when I told you that um, we are privileged to be in 2024, it's true. I don't know if you've ever been caught cheating at school. It's not fun. Happened in eighth grade and 10th grade in math class. And so when that happened, the thing about it was is that, that you're looking at someone else who's done the work and then taking the answers. That's part of why I think it's awesome to be in 2024. Because we have 2,000 years of smart people heart, who've wrestled with doubt, wrestled with the Bible, wrestled with faith. And we have 2,000 years of people who've asked all the questions that you've asked and they've done the homework and they've shown the work and we've got it recorded. This list right here is just a short list of some people that I find to be credible sources. If you've had a question, more often than not, whether it's regard to science or anything else, it, you find it on those. And these are people that are mathematicians and theologians and historians. One of the guys on here was a, um, he was an ex uh, cold case homicide um, investigator, an atheist. And after pursuing, seeing if he could prove Jesus wrong, became a Christian. And so these are sites for people that have asked the hard questions, that you have legitimate questions, that they've ha found legitimate answers. Their hard doubt was not their out. It actually led them to be strong believers and advocates of Jesus. And the cool thing is this, we've got them. We've got 2,000 years of homework, but we still have what Jesus gave us in the Bible itself. John writes this. He says, the disciples, this is at the end of John. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. In other words, I could have written a lot more. I mean, I could have kept on going. I didn't, but I could have. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Thomas faced his doubt 
with Jesus. And it led to depth. Not, it didn't lead to an out. It was, in fact, a doorway to depth. And that could be our story as well. I want, us to encourage, I want to encourage you to be the people that are wrestling with your questions, not burying them. Being the type of people that are receiving them well, not burying them. And when that happens, I believe that we're going to find our faith growing deeper and deeper and deeper. And again, if that's not your story, if your deal is that it's not my doubts, it's my past, come next week because we're going to talk about Peter and the regret and how did Jesus deal with the fact that sometimes we've done messed up stuff we can't forget and we wish we could, but we have a God who actually deals with them in an amazing way. Let's stand for prayer. I'm going to have the prayer team come forward. After we finish praying, if you have prayer about anything going on in life that you would like someone to pray with you about, come up to the front. They're going to be up here, and that'll be fantastic. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are, in fact, someone that doesn't dodge hard questions. You are not somebody that ducks away from them or gives us the impression that asking hard questions is is weakness, but instead, God, you meet us. You met Thomas. And the product of that is that we're able to go with stronger faith, deeper belief. Lord, I pray that you help us be the type of church that boldly asks and is merciful with hard questions. I will give you the thanks and the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Love you, church. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't already, follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay connected throughout the week. For more information and to check out all of our amazing ministries, head to www.missionbible.church. Join us next week as we continue our series on the final 40 days of the life of Christ. Until then, keep being real with God, real with each other, and real in the world.